What's up, everyone? I'm Digital Soul. Hey, what's up? It's your boy, Big Blue. And we are the Purple Brothers. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of the Purple Brothers. I have here a, a very, very, very funky brother here. Uh, so glad that he uh, gave us a little bit of his time here tonight. So we can have a little discussion with him uh, about uh, his time with Prince and and many, many, many other great bands and players that he's played with, and uh, as a talented trombonist, and not only not only trombonist, man, but he plays other horns too. So we're gonna definitely get into that. Uh oh, this brother, funky as I as I don't as he want to be, Mister Brother Greg Boyer is in the house tonight. Yay! <laughs> yes, sir. Hey, thanks for everything. Appreciate the uh, the the heartfelt, wonderful uh, intro there. Absolutely, man. Absolutely, man. So glad to have you here, man. And I know, um, you know, we, you know, our musicians, I'm a musician myself. And, you know, a lot of us have been having some downtime during the last year and things are starting right. to pick up, you know, and I, and I, I seen you on the yeah. move lately, man. So uh, how's that feeling getting back into the groove of performing and being back on stage out there now? Uh, I feel like I'm, I'm back to my natural self. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that um that 2020 was uh an eye opener of immense magnitude, but yeah. now things are starting to relax a little bit. And you know, that's keeping in mind that they're able to, you know, control this uh this new variant or the new variants TS that are yeah. uh, headed our way, but I think a lot of it is, you know, with whoever it is getting vaccinated. The vax numbers in Maryland are pretty good. So you're kind of, you know, keeping things at bay. But, you know, people just are more considerate of their surroundings and stuff instead of trying to, you know, be internet scientists and, you know, <laughs> political sway and all of that stuff. And, yeah. and um, you know, what was Bullwinkle's name? Mr. Know-it-all, yeah. <laughs> know <it all>. yeah. <laughs> just Just do it, you know. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, just yeah. do the damn thing. Shit. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, no, you can, you're good. Oh, okay. You can, yeah, you can. Yeah, we we cuss like a teller. It's, it's all good. You're good. No, we we're all going. <laughs> yeah, just being respectful. <laughs> no, it's all good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but for for us, because we know we we just have a love for music and um, we miss being outdoors. We miss going to to the concerts. I think my last concert, I was able to see, um, I saw two actually, it was Frankie Beverly and Maze, and I, that was the first time I ever seen Frankie Beverly ever in my life. Wow. Then, yeah, it took me forever, but I'm glad I had the opportunity to see him live, because he's just, Oops. that's another Something show happened. itself. Yeah. yeah. You know what? I have seen Frankie Beverly only sparingly. Uh, it was We were on an outdoor hit a long, long time ago, P Funk and and Frankie Beverly and I forget who else. So I was like, "Well, this is an opportunity to uh, to see Mays live." Yeah. But I yeah. think our transportation was like, "Oh, we got to get y'all out of here before the crowd, you know, starts <laughs> leaving." So I didn't get a chance to see the whole show. Hmm. Dang. Yeah, Frankie Beverly, man, he's one of the one of the great legends still here with us, giving us great concerts to this day, man. Yeah, that's the that's the black national anthem, man. Before I let go, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. everybody, everybody is singing that song in the audience, and everybody's wearing white. Everybody's wearing white. You you know you have an anthem when you perform a song live, and all you do is just hold the microphone out there and say, "Y'all sing it," <laughs> and everybody is nailing it. You see, you you yeah. want something at that point. Yeah. Right, right, exactly, and got the and got the dance steps to go with it and everything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 man. That's that's what it, that's what it is, man. At a, it was yeah, fast to have that experience to watch it because look, this is a brother who had an album out in like thirty five years, and yeah. he's still touring off his hits. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's that. it's legends, he's legend. I mean, yeah, I, I, uh, I was on Frank. Frankie and uh and Mays when they first came out with um the uh the album who remembers albums with uh with happy feelings I go back that far so yeah oh yeah man. yeah definitely yeah, yeah. 
So let's talk about your, you know, your, your humble beginnings, brother. When you first start getting into um, musician, being a musician, when did it start for you? I was about four. Wow. <laughs> now, now, mind <laughs> you, it, it it wasn't official, but I knew at that point I was going to play something. Mm -hmm. you know, I got one. I got one of those little plastic saxophones, and. <laughs> You know, when I was holding it all up in the air, playing like the guys on TV, because, you know, in, in the 60s, it was not hard to find musicians playing instruments on television. Mm -hmm. You know, if it wasn't uh, Ricky Ricardo and Lucy, The Tonight yeah. Show, uh, Midnight Special, Don Kirshner's Rock Concert, Ed Sullivan, there was a whole bunch of shows back then that had musicians, so the inspiration was everywhere. Mm -hmm. So my thing was, you know, I wanted to be like uh, those guys that play with like, um, you know, all the more rock and roll saxophone players dun, 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 yeah. as a little kid. So naturally, <laughs> my first introduction into music formally you know, in a school band setting was on saxophone. Wow. That's how it all started. Yeah. So was that a alto, alto sax? Yeah, alto sax. Yeah, I was 10. Now, wow. the year before that, I, I kidnapped my dad's harmonica, and I was playing <laughs> with that. No, really, he had it in the top of the closet, and it was one of them bright colors, like green and white, you know, one of them, you know, catching kids' eyes colors. Yeah. So when he would leave the house, I would sneak up there and play it. When I heard him come in, I would put it back. <laughs> <laughs> I was into it deep. One time, just so much, he came back and I didn't know. <laughs> so he saw me with it. He's like, you know, oh, fuck, go ahead, keep it, man. And <laughs> I, I, I took it everywhere with me. And unfortunately, I, I took a bath and took the harmonica with me because it looked like a cruise ship to me. So I was just going to put it in the water uh, <laughs> and, and then get it back out. You know, when I, when I was all cleaned up and everything, but I drowned it. It didn't work anymore after that. Oh, <laughs> man. So the following year, I got a, uh, an alto saxophone. My uncle had one in his closet, and he said, here, you can play that. You know, people were giving me instruments then. I thought that was very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And then uh, you do play tenor. I know you play tenor, too, as well, correct? Yeah. Uh, I started on an alto and I switched to baritone sax two years later. And the year after that, I was playing guitar and bass and switched to tuba. And I was playing bass in church, trombone yeah. in the high school big band and, you know, march with tuba. And then my first gig was on tenor saxophone when I was 15. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You know, I'm, I'm too old to, I mean, I'm too young to be in this club, right? But the guy <laughs> yeah. was like, well, you know, you can play, you young boy and everything, but you go up to this bar and try to get some drinks, I'm kicking your ass out. So <laughs> we, we had to understand that I didn't drink anyway, man. So I right. was safe, you know. So is that one of the local groups like out there in your area at that time? Yeah, it was a group called The Chosen Few. Mm. Okay. And I played in uh, two different lineups with that band locally. And, wow. Yeah. And I was uh, also playing uh, bass trombone and tuba in St. Mary's College Jazz Ensemble in my junior and senior year in high school. Right. So I would get half a day, then drive down to the school playing that band, and then, you know, come back and just be a knucklehead kid and, you know, irresponsible and all that kind of stuff that kids do when they're teenagers. So, right. It, and that, that's pretty much it, you know, leading up to getting with P-Funk, but that might be another question. So I'm just going to leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> but, so I know, I know you said you started off, you know, alto and tenor pretty early, you know, in your life. Yeah. And I know you just didn't, you just didn't start playing. There had to be some, some music around the house that you listened to. And, and 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 it's funny because I know trombonus, which is a very very unique horn. It's a, it's a very very good sounding horn because you can do so many tricks with it. Right. Who were some of the the artists that you listened to? Whether it would have been saxophone, trombone, flute. Who were some of the artists, uh, jazz artists, or whoever it may have been that you influenced? Well, 
uh, uh, needless to say, I was a hardcore Parliament Funkadelic fan. You even know, before you got with them? Even before I got with them. Uh, matter yeah. of fact, my favorite member of the band was Pedro Bell. Uh, the artist. <laughs> the artist, yeah. And I, I had, and I used to do all kinds of little artwork and stuff and draw yeah. pictures. Okay. It, it looked like they were acid influenced, but now, all yeah, I know yeah. was it was it was it was pretty cool that a guitar would have legs on one end and a head on the other and yeah, you know man. strings in the middle and it, it, stuff like that just went on. You've seen the covers before, man. Oh man, they're they're iconic, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, matter of fact, it's a rite of passage. When Funkadelic put an album out, you would go down to the store, get it, put the album mm -hmm. on. While the album is playing, you open it up. Mm -hmm. And you clean your weed inside and let the seeds grow <laughs> down, <laughs> twist to a fat one, and, right. and, and then you just sit there and just read all of the cartoons in the cover. Right. Sometimes that would take days. So right. Right. that meant a lot of playing and a lot of rolling, you know. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I know. Yeah, so yeah, that was um, you know, what you did when you got one of those, and it was it wasn't just Parliament Funkadelic. I was influenced by uh, Hendrix, Larry Graham, Sly Stone. I was the uh, jazz influences were Gene Ammons and Richard Grew Holmes because my parents had an extensive yeah. jazz record collection. Yeah, and just from them playing the records, I was able to know a lot of standards before I even pick the horn up. You know, yeah, I get totally. it. It's like, uh, oh, that's that song that, you know, my dad was playing the other day and I figured that out. And then yeah, and, and my sister, you know, she had all of the uh, 45s, the latest groups and stuff. And my cousin had the Motown. My older brother played all the James Brown you could shake a stick at. That's another one of my big influences. Yeah, and absolutely. So it was jazz, soul, you know, Motown. Little rock and roll because, and, and, and the rock and roll thing was funny because we used to uh, ride a bus. The schools were integrated, but we used to pick up the kids in the white neighborhood and pick up the kids in the black neighborhood. And the bus driver would play the radio, and she mm -hmm. played White Station. And you know, we would be like, "Hey, well, what about us?" So <laughs> she got the idea, and, and it really worked in my favor. She got the idea to play. A black station one day and then the next day played a white station uh, and she will alternate now alternate. i'm guessing the same way i was learning a whole lot of rock and roll tunes on the white kids was learning a lot of funk and r&b and soul the same way yeah so, you know it worked out for everybody man so and and that's you know the influence part of my upbringing it was just everything Right, right, yeah, and I, and I know, I, I know. Sometimes when you play, man, you have a lot of. Uh, I know some. I, and, and Rue would tell you, man, uh, the the three the three things that I want to do want to touch upon that are my favorite things in life that you're a part of, and Rube's my witness. Okay. Prince, yeah, Parliament Funkadelic, yeah, and go go music, and oh, and go go sure. music, go go music because I'm a, I'm a percussionist. Okay. So, so my, my my question is, when you when you were when you were playing with when you eventually got with P Funk, yeah, how did your style from a, you know from playing in the early days did did you use anything from you know from those influences when you got because P Funk was your first big professional gig, correct? Yeah, I started playing with him when I was nineteen. 19 okay so 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 all along from you know from from a child going you know through your teenage years of playing and playing yeah what did you take with you to p-funk and then interpolate into their live act well I, I feel like world? i feel like that my biggest influence with p-funk was playing jazz okay because you know i was i've already played in a few jazz groups by the time i joined p-funk Okay. And then um, and then playing with Prince was mostly because he wanted Maceo in his band. He saw us playing and he says, and bring the trombone player with you because he didn't want to break up the chemistry. Yeah. So 
you know, but by the time I had gotten with Prince, I was already, you know, listening to a lot of stuff. I had been playing Go-Go for a while, playing with Maceo for about four years. And and then, you know, just the the, the history I had with P-Funk, I played with him for 19 years before I retired. Yeah. So it was, you know, influences were coming from everywhere. Even when I would take trips to Philly, like we used to go there in the summertime and we used to drive through the Latin neighborhood and they would have the salsa blasting out the window, right? And I was like, man, what's that? I like <laughs> right. it. It, it, was, it was rhythmic, it was party music and had lots of horns. Mm -hmm. So... So that, you know, along with the, uh, the, the Ricky Ricardo band that I mentioned earlier and all of the Mambo <laughs> stuff, you know, I, I, I was just getting it from all sides, man. And, yeah. you know, I, I apply every bit of what I grew up with or what swayed my, you know, my heart to just about every gig I did, you know, given the opportunity. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't want to go into a merengue beat in the middle of Purple Rain. So, <laughs> yeah, that's funny. So, so playing with with, with Parliament Funkadelic, man, I mean, they're they're, they're legendary uh, rock and roll Hall of Fame. Um, the best of the best has come has has come out of that conglomerate, uh, including yourself. What are some of your best memories? Or you know, best tour, best recording sessions. What are your What are some of your best memories of recording with George and some of the crew and making some of those recordings, or or even re, you know playing them live? Well, from recording standpoint, I think the most memorable one is the first one. You know, I'd never been in a recording studio before, and it was just all new to me. I'm looking around like you know, I'm, yeah. will, I'm walking into Willy Wonka or something. It's like, yeah. wow, look, it's, you know, padding on the wall and microphones hanging from the ceiling. There's a booth with glass between me and the guy and the control <laughs> board. Ah, ah, ah. And that was, that was on uh, Parlette's Invasion of the Booty Snatchers. Ah, uh, okay. And uh, not only did we play, but we even got a chance to arrange a lot of the stuff. Um, mm -hmm. The horn arrangements were pretty much a joint effort by myself and and Benny Cowan and Greg Thomas uh, yeah. of the three uh, P-Funk horns. And so, yeah, that session was probably the, the most memorable one because it was, you know, I hadn't Perfect. done one before. Yeah. You know, everything after that was, okay, I've been here before, let's do it again. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome, man, that's awesome. So what is your favorite P-Funk record you ever played on? Mm. Uh, probably Glory Halla Stupid. Because <laughs> now, now, the one song on there was like a horn section feature yeah. of yeah. Big Bang Theory. And it's just like all us, all the way through. Boom, boom. And um, yeah. it, it, it was a saxophone <laughs> solo on there that wasn't in the studio. So when it was released, it's like, where'd that come from? I don't remember that guy. And but still, you know, it was like pretty much we were out front and center. So, and yeah. then um, theme from the black hole was the uh, the other one on there. So, I think as far as the ones that I played on, that probably was the best one because everything after that was just like real spotty, you know, blip blop blop, and okay, that's a wrap, and that's all we did on the whole album. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. So, so I know um, you played. You said you meant to play with P Funk for 19 years, and um, I, I, I'm I'm actually disappointed that I never got to see this brother live because this is a, another bad brother uh, that you play with, who is also legendary uh, and is no longer here with us. Brother uh, Chuck Brown. Oh man, uh, yeah, he the the best to ever do it, and uh, I know you pl you played with him forever. Yeah, uh, talk about talk about your time transitioning from P Funk because I knew you were kind of doing both uh, for a little bit period yeah. of time. You know, yeah. Chuck had, Chuck had an understanding. He's like, look, 
I, I like having good musicians around, but the curse is, you know, sometimes they get gigs and they have to go on tour. And yeah. he wasn't hurting for anybody to substitute for us when we got, because actually P-Funk Horns as a section was playing with Chuck Brown. We went in together. And mm -hmm. then when I uh, quit playing with P-Funk, I, I stayed with the Chuck Brown band. I still play with that band now, even um, after he passed, the band is still going and I'm still playing with them. And that started in 1989. Wow. wow. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it's funny. I just moved back from LA in 88. You know, Greg and Benny were like, man, you need to get back here. You know, these horn sections, these go-go horn sections are hurting, you know, and, and we can fill the void. So I got back and I was playing with a group called Sluggo. Um, then I was playing with Little Benny and the Masters. And okay. that's, that's when Chuck heard us. And, and he uttered the statement, I'm the only one in town that's qualified to pay you. I say, I say, you swinging a big stick, man. Let's see what you can hit. And <laughs> he was right. <laughs> and the cool thing about the Chuck Brown gig is one, it, it it paid well. You know, I'm in it for the money. That's why I'm called a professional musician. It, it paid well. And you still got to play a little bit of jazz every now and he might throw you a solo and you know, you would do some section work and the gigs were so late, you could do anything before and still make it to the Chuck gig on time. Yeah. Now that coupled with the, the party factor that, you know, and anybody knows anything about Go-Go knows quite well that the audience is just as much a part of the band as anybody on stage. Oh yeah. So, yeah. And and that to this day is one of my favorite gigs still. Yeah, and that, and that kept you working all year long, doing between both. <laughs> oh, Chuck, Chuck was hot for a minute, you know. It was yeah. before I got in the band, he was playing five, six nights a week regularly. Wow. In wow. town. And it's funny because I was asked to join Fishbone back in 98. And they shot me a figure, you know. Yeah. I was like, I'm making that kind of money at home. You know, why should I travel, leave home to make the same money I could do it here? And they like, well, we understand. And, you know, we thought about you. We offered it to you. And I was like, you know, I really appreciate that. They were coming to town. They said, if you feel like it, come on down to the bayou, you sit in. And I did, and they happened to be opening for Maceo that night. So I was playing, and Maceo was like, hey, there's a trombone player that opened the band and looked out there and saw me, He's like, hey, man, you want to sit in and play a couple of songs? I said, sure. So I did, and he asked me to, he said, if you're interested, man, you know, we'd like to call you up, do some European dates for a couple of weeks. And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm available. And... I've been playing with that band since then. <laughs> <laughs> what you locked in, you locked in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of stuff is, it, it, it helps to be able to, you know, to play and all this stuff, but a lot of it is being in the right place at the right time. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, absolutely. opportunity arises, be ready. You know, if you yeah. stay ready, you don't have to get ready. That's right. Because right. getting ready takes time. If you stay ready, <laughs> you know, the, the clock ain't rolling. So yeah. exactly. exactly. That's what they say, man. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you still feel like, um, I know like DC, Maryland, you know, in that general area, go-go is, is like, you know, that is, it's it out there. Do you, I, do you think that um, go-go music still does not get the recognition it deserves in other states and things like that? Um. I say yes and I say no. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it gets the recognition it deserves. But the thing is, outside of D.C., I don't think anybody really knows what to do with it because it's more than just a beat. Yeah. It's, a, it's a movement. It's a lifestyle. It's um, yeah. and, and shoot, depending on who you talk to, it's a religion. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, like case in point, you know, D.C. is, you know, being gentrified just like a lot of places are now. And there's a place at uh, 7th and Florida. It's a um, mobile phone place. 
and the guy sits out there and puts the speaker outside the door and plays go-go all day. And it's no big issue, but you know, now that everybody, there's some new neighbors in the neighborhood and they're like, <laughs> ah, that's, oh, we don't like it. It's all that noise and it's so-and-so. <laughs> they call the, you know, they try to have the guy to stop playing the music and to spawn the don't mute DC movement. You know, mm. people show it, they show it out, you know, like those big crowds that just like take up a whole intersection. Mm-hmm. It was it was a couple of gatherings like that. It's like, look, Gogo has been here before you got here, you know, Mr. New Resident, new neighbor. And <laughs> it's, it's gonna be here when you decide to leave. So, you know, you ain't gonna you can ask all you want, but Gogo ain't going anywhere. And yeah, and, and you know. And that's what I mean, you know, something that part of the that much of the fabric of a, a city is you ain't going to just drown it, mash it out, kick it out, or is it going to die anything? They um, they're going to keep it rolling. Matter of fact, Gogo is officially the music of Washington, D.C. Yeah, the bill was signed last year. Yeah, yeah. hereby decreed. So, yeah. you know. You don't like yeah. it, you get some new windows, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man, for that, man. Yeah, yeah, that bill was last year, man. I was excited about that too. Very yeah. cool. Very but cool. I, I, I really feel like that, you know, outside of the city, there are not, people do get it, but there are not people, that, there are not enough people to get it. You know, mm. you, um, it's just banging the noise to, you know, record executives they don't know how to package it because really the 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 best go-go is it's kind of hard to record it it's kind of hard to you know make a video of it you have to be there when it happens yeah yeah and 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 that the whole experience the atmosphere of it is impossible to catch otherwise yeah yeah that's one of the things i do enjoy about it too is the the spot the spontaneity of go you know, there, you know, there's there, there's a lot of freedom. You know, all, all you basically need is a good swinging beat, uh, percussion, and, and and a good horn section, basically. And they, you can just like the go go is you go all night. You know, mm-hmm. and, 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 and that's the thing too. You know, there's a lot of things that you know the, the, the guy you know up front will say, and the people automatically know what to respond. It's like you know. If you go to church or something, you know, the pastor will say something, you know, the Lord be with you. And everybody knows to say, and with thy spirit, let us pray. You know, Go-Go has tons of stuff just like that. Yeah. And And it's automatic. Yeah, it's automatic that that way. Because if you go somewhere, you know, outside of this area and you say those things, nobody will know what to say next. <laughs> I said, you know, tell me how you feel like doing, and you know, how you feel, what you feel like doing, y'all. And everybody yeah. like, uh, dancing. <laughs> I said, no, no, no. <laughs> you know, not enough people know that, you know, the next thing to come out of your mouth should be feel like moving that body. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it's got its own code, you know. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I feel like that if if you introduce the public to it in increments, you know, everybody knows the groove. If you bring an authentic groove, not just a beat, and, yeah. and let that settle, and then on top of that, then you start to build people's knowledge of mm-hmm. what go-go really is then maybe at that point it'll blow up you know yeah and, and you, I, you thought that you know being in uh, the spike Lee movie uh doing the butt that you know maybe something will come of it because now it's starting to really get some you know nationwide recognition but i don't think it was taken full advantage of because mm-hmm. you know let's face it you know this is some people here that are shooting progress in the foot you know it, uh, in the uh, name of oh, that's not authentic enough or you know why couldn't you call somebody from dc to do that you know them la dudes don't know about no go-go and it just 
you know, and, and people coming in, you got Snoop Dogg coming in, getting a piece of it, CeeLo coming in, getting a piece of it, yeah. Grace Jones, and, and you know, Kid and Play, Salt and Pepper, all of these people coming in there and, and getting a pinch of this. And, you know, don't be mad, you know, just say, you know, thanks for recognizing this thing. And if you yeah. need any any more, mm, give us a call. <laughs> you, you know where to look. <laughs> yeah, you know where to look, exactly. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, and those are, um, and you you hit on some great, because uh, I think of Kid and Play, I, I automatically think uh, rolling, 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 Kid and Play, uh -huh. now. Oh, la, oh, la, that whole joint. That's go. Yeah. They represented Go Go. That was what, back in like 89 or so? Yeah, it is. 88, 89. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, 80s go go was faster than 90s go go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Very yeah. true. Definitely. I mean, think back to Bustin' Loose, man. You know, that was. Woo! <laughs> Wasn't that yeah. early 80s or late 70s? I don't know. 79. 79, 78, 79. 78, yeah. 79, yeah. I feel like busting loose. Ooh, that, that, song, that song to this day, man. It, it, that song is just like. Brick House, yeah. Atomic Dog. It don't matter when or where you put on Bust and Lou, that song is still going to get the party joy. Yeah, it's, it's what I refer to as a Black music milestone. It is, man. That song yeah. right there is still hot to this day. Like, it yeah. came out yesterday. Fire, man. The horn, oh, no doubt. The horns make the song. The horns is just incredible. Yeah. Da, 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 da. And that's the other thing too is that people will play that line. Da, 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 da. And those notes right there, nobody ever seems to get it right. It's like, uh, what's that? Then take the needle and put it back and play it again. Mm, no, I didn't get it. <laughs> I think Chuck did that intentionally. Was put this line in there that was so crazy that it was hard to break code on it. <laughs> Sir. And I know I know um you did I know you mentioned for like back in when you're doing some things with Parlet, um you were doing some writing and arrangement. Uh when did you start to write? Or or how did you start to write? Um shoot, right from the start. Cause okay. you know, ideas go in and out of my head. So okay. a, a lot of times when I get something, I write it down to make sure that. I don't forget it. Okay. And as a matter of fact, I started, even in our musical training, I started when I was 10 years old. By 11 years old, I was already doing arrangements. Okay. Because, you know, I would just hear stuff and just like write it down. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I might have been, you know, cutting my teeth. It's like, you know, seeing them cubs go out there and catch a baby deer, they won't eat it. They just keep swinging at the bottom legs, just trying mm -hmm. to get the skills shot. So that I felt like that's what I was doing was, um, you know, just trying to work on my writing chops. So uh, I'd been arranging, shoot, almost right from the beginning. So wow. I got with par, and then you know I would go ahead and write a write a line down and yeah stuff, and then you know with with just any group I was in, I was, I mean, I was even writing big band stuff when I was like, you know, 17 or 18. Wow, very cool. Uh, yeah. Do you feel like now at this time, like, um, I feel like music, people are not really reading or learning to read music anymore. It's like, you know, when I was in school, junior high and high school, it was it was prevalent. You know, what I mean, you could yeah. you could take um, beginning band or intermediate band, and you're learning the notes and you're learning how to read. But it seems like nowadays it's not really the case anymore. It's, and a lot of it is like they take it out of the schools. You know, band exactly. You know, and that's the issue. You know what I mean? Yeah, they're slashing the budgets, and you know, yeah. arts. You know, music and, and visual arts and stuff are usually the first thing to go. So, you know, kids nowadays don't have the luxury of just going to school, picking an instrument and learning how to play at school. They have to go to like a, a music store where, you know, somebody's teaching them in the back next yeah. to all the cases and stuff. 
<laughs> and, and 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 that more than anything is, is the culprit behind people not really playing their instruments anymore. It's just like there's no influence. I mean, really think about it. You turn on the t- TV now. Who's playing a real instrument? You'd be hard pressed to find unless you turn on PBS and they got like a symphony on there or something. Mm-hmm. You'd be hard pressed to find somebody playing. I mean, you might find somebody if you're lucky enough playing real guitars and drums and keys and stuff. But horn players are almost like a like dinosaur. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's like a dinosaur. Yeah, and that's why I'm so happy that <clears throat> Prince incorporated. Uh, horns later on I mean I started to see the horns back in uh, and I had this conversation with John before I think around 85 when around that time when he did America the live version of America the video with yeah. uh, Eric Leeds and um, Eddie M yeah cold cold I was like okay this is dope this is dope and then later down the line you have what the MPG horns and that was just like I never thought exactly. that would bring in horns like he did yeah and uh you know he had different line lineups of uh horn sections and I, I think he was really all in when he hired the horn heads at five piece out of minneapolis and yeah yeah because because thing was like uh matt bliss and, and, and eric leeds a nice two-piece and then they added eddie m as a nice little three-piece but he wanted that fat you know, thick tower power ish kind of horn section. He went with the horn heads, and he's been that way since. You know, it's like I I, I got to have a horn section. Aside from you know those times when he has his rock trio fits, right? Yeah, <laughs> third eye girl. Yeah, he was going hard with that. But it was it, it was interesting for me. Like I when I went to the musicology tour, I went the first night in Los Angeles. Yeah, I. And to hear him play DMSR and have horns incorporated yeah. with that, I was like, wow. That's yeah, yeah absolutely. Now, now, a lot of that was he would have the horns play, you know, existing keyboard parts. Cause and then every once in a while he's like, okay, do something I haven't written or played. And then that's when we would come in and do whatever lines that we had. And yeah, I was just, you know, recycling old P-Funk stuff and Maceo would re- recycle some old James stuff. And and Eric Lees, when he was in there, would just come up with this, you know, really super slick, but very well-fitting stuff. Yeah, like man. that, uh, you were speaking earlier about that uh, America, that yes. that about that, 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 that. Da, da, da. Now, now, according to Eric, that was a line that he heard off of Miles Davis' "Bitches Brew." It's some little line that Miles is playing in the background, and he incorporated that into um, the um, the live version of America. Wow! That's it. And and Prince wow. was Prince was a huge Miles fan. And you know, Miles even came to dinner and with Prince and and Eric yeah. got to sit there with him. And I I can remember correctly, Miles kind of mentioned that, hey, I know where that line came from. <laughs> <laughs> and Prince told Eric, don't ever play that again. <laughs> I don't want him to put that man in a ever again to put him in a position where he could say that to me so you know to kind of scratch that line out of it because you know it was you know off of a miles davis record but <laughs> it was so dope it was so dope when he did it that's before he went to the drums and he started doing this thing yeah. on the drums. yeah it was and then he would stop the band he's like no let's do it again and just the one again he loved that line up until <laughs> he found out that it was, um, yeah, I, I guess what he thought was lightweight plagiarism. <laughs> and he's like, Uh-oh. don't do that anymore. <laughs> I get it. I, I get it. That, but it was, during that time, it was it was great to listen to. It was great to listen to. Man. I don't think I never heard it again, right? He never really played played that live anymore. 
especially with the horns and stuff. No, Miles shut it down. That was it. That was it. <laughs> but, but but I'm but telling you, Miles man. Beat, listen. Yep. <laughs> and, and I don't think Miles had an issue with it. Miles' thing, if I can, you know, kind of pick his brain. I'm playing junior psychologist when I say this. He's probably <laughs> flattered that the line made it in the Prince's show because it was so obscure. Yeah. He's like, well, if you're paying that close attention to what I'm doing, then, you know, yeah. I'm obviously, you know, provide you with a, a a really decent musical influence. And, you know, who wouldn't be mad at that? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. ain't out and out stealing the song, which, you know, <laughs> you get to that in the Library of Congress copyright issues and publishing right. and everything. That's yeah. another monster. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Talk, talk a little bit about, um, since we're touching on MPG, talk about your entrance into the MPG. Um, well, like, like I mentioned before, you know, Prince was doing a session and couldn't get the sax player to sound like Maceo to save his life because that's what he wanted. So he's like, dang, why don't I just go get Maceo? Mm. So he got Macy on the band and everything. And then like I said, man, you know, he saw the, 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 the chemistry between us. It's like, whatever you two got, I wanted it as a package. And that's how I got hired. And that was in 2002. Mm -hmm. It was the, the one night alone tour, the, the right. supposed right. jazz tour, right? Right. right. Yeah. It's funny because George Benson, he had a hollow body guitar then. Yes, you know, and, and George Benson autographed it, but he autographed it on the back. So oh, wow. by the time Prince was playing and the guitar was rubbing all up against him and stuff, uh, he had uh, he had rubbed that autograph halfway off of the back of the guitar. <laughs> he didn't like that. He's like all the trouble I went through to get that. I want to keep it on there. I was like, dude, you ever hear the clear tape? <laughs> 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 yeah, that was during that time. I think he was playing that hollow body doing he would play um the song Strolling a lot. And mm -hmm. that. So yeah. he played that played the hollow body on there. Yeah. Yes, he did. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Who, but, what would you say what would you say was your hardest prince gig, if you if you can think of one? Good question. He well, the the musicology tour, we rehearsed for like three months straight and we were doing like 10 hours a day and stuff. Mm -hmm. Now there was a lot of work involved in that, but I got to think the hardest thing, you know, he, Prince really held my feet through the fire when he flew me out. He was doing a Jay Leno show and mm -hmm. he wanted to do a song called Somewhere Here on Earth. Yes. And um, oh, man. he flew me out at noon on like a Tuesday. Then he says, I want you to write some orchestral woodwind arrangements to accompany this song. And he says, and I want you to find the players, you know, in a city I don't live in. So, you know, I had to, you know, ask this person, ask this person to come up with, you know, seven woodwind players. And, you know, it, it, these aren't like funky jazzy guys. These are like orchestral, you know, folks. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and maybe a couple of them play a little jazz on the side. Matter of fact, I know uh, uh, Catisse Buckingham is, is a slaying um, flautist, saxophonist, and he can spit some verse too. Yeah. So, <clears throat> but I had to do all of this and have it ready by eight o'clock the next night. So I had 30 hours to pull all of this together. <laughs> And and it happened. Wow. And I, I don't think I've ever sweat so hard in my life on a gig because you know it was a daunting task and the and the deadline was like super, super close. Mm -hmm. It's it's the kind of thing if I had my way about me, I would have given myself at least four days, at least. Yeah. And you know, a week to really be comfortable. And I, I gotta think that that probably was like not just the the hardest thing that I've ever done for Prince, but probably the the, the crowning jewel of my musical career was yeah. to be able to throw all of that together and have it come out as good as it did in such short yeah. time. Yeah, limited. You had to write 
you had to write some arrange. You had to arrange um, the words. Yeah. I had to write the arrangements. Yeah. Find the musicians, get the arrangements to the musicians, and have it ready in from the time I landed, which was like noon, to eight o'clock the next night. So I had literally thirty hours to to pull it together. Wow! So you, you didn't sleep that day. <laughs> yeah. And, and, I got, I got, I got to tell you, man. Um, and me, me and Ruben, we did a show a while back on the five favorite top Prince ballads, and that song actually made my list as an honorable mention of wow. that performance. And that song is one, one of the most amazing songs, especially towards the later part of his career. Yeah, because I, I always, you know, you know, Prince was always known, you know. We 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 knew him, you know, with the with the bikini underwear and you know the trench coat and yeah. you know sexy MF, you know things like that. But there were times when he had you know those songs and you know that image. But there was always that left song. Strolling was one of those songs. You I know, mean, Strolling was on the same album as you know uh, what was it, sexy MF? No, not yeah. sexy. MF. That was uh, on Diamonds and Pearls. Get off, get Diamonds off. Was okay, get off. Yeah. Right, so but he always, you know, you have under the cherry moon, which had do you lie? So it was always a song where he kind of went left, and I consider somewhere here on Earth that song for Planet Earth. You know, Planet Earth yeah. to me was a good driving, good driving album, but that song, yeah. something about that song, man, it was just, it was just amazing and well put together. Yeah, and, and you know that that's a misnomer too. A lot of people were thinking, oh, later on in his career he wasn't writing as many hits, but he was still writing some good music. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And you say somewhere here on earth and, and my favorite was uh, Get On A Boat. 31, yeah. 21 album, yeah. Because I'll tell you about that session. He just, you know, figuratively hung a mic from the ceiling counted to four and said, let's go. So that was a very live endeavor. It wasn't like he did one track, then a couple of days later, he would come back and do another, you know how lost songs can be. You know, you go in and lay in bass and drums one day, then you think about yeah. it. What guitar part am I gonna put? No, that was like all in one night. And it, it, it God awful funky <laughs> man. Yeah. yeah, that record that's a cold record there, too. Yeah, man. I like Bo Nose Funk. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so what did, did you guys just basically like freestyle it? I mean, he just told you, Let's go. He, you just well, he kind of gave us a skeleton, and then he okay. said, I want the bridge to go like this. So they might have been maybe, I'd say, no more than an hour of this is what we're going to do. And and then after that, it was just like one, two, three, four. I was like, boy, what an entrance. <laughs> so I dug it, man. That's um, that, that was one of my favorite. No, that was my favorite Prince session. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. wow. Very cool. Yeah. One of the best songs on that album. That's the last song on that album, too. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Dope. What I, what I do like about uh, your plan, too, is that you, I think we mentioned this earlier, that you use uh, tricks. And uh, I seen you on one occasion, you use that plunger muzzle yeah. thing, too. And uh, that's one of the things that's really cool about trombones, man. You can do a lot of tricks and get a lot of different sounds, almost like someone talking. Uh, like like talking Charlie about... Brown's teacher. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. As a matter of fact, yeah. the, the latest Charlie Brown movie that came out it featured Trombone Shorty as Charlie mm -hmm. Brown's teacher. And yeah. But yeah. that, that goes way, way back to early, early jazz. You know, we just use a plunger. And ain't nothing special. It's the same plunger you use on a toilet. You just mm -hmm. unscrew the stick 
and just yeah. wah 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 with it. So yeah. And that's yeah. what that, that's what I like too, because it does remind me of those old 40s jazz recordings when you used to see them back, those black and white recordings back in the day when you see them yeah. with the slick and the suits, and then you see the guy standing there doing that thing with the horn. It's, it's yeah. some really cool stuff back then. Just the image, you know. And then have you ever seen Maceo Parker with his hair slick? You ever seen the old video of Maceo? Um <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, when, when he was playing with Boosie. Yeah, yeah. Macy, yeah. Fred, and Kush, all of them had to um, do <laughs> like like some of that holdover James Brown stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, I tell you, what was really funny was there was a lot of people in P Funk that was still wearing their hair like that when I got in the band. So <laughs> on off days, these grown ass men. You know, walking around with rollers in their hair and stuff. <laughs> but, but come showtime, they was rock and roll ready. And looking good. Yeah, they were looking good, man. And like, okay. Yeah, you you had a you had a unique uh trend too, man. I you know, like I said, a huge fan of P Fuck, man. I've seen you play with them in, in the MPG quite a few times, man. But I know back in the day I used to see you with P Funk and you started the biker short uh, trend. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I was thinking about that. I was like, wait a minute. Everybody in the, in the, in the uh, 80s was wearing, you know, bike shorts and spandex. Yeah. And, stuff. and I remember, because yeah. before I got, well, I was like a two-year period between P-Funk being off in 81 and 83. And I started doing bike messenger were in DC. I was carrying mail around stuff. So I was, you know, I was a cyclist for real. I wasn't just wearing the shorts just to be wearing them. And yeah. I just said, hey, this would be something cool to wear on stage. And, and and sure enough, man, I started wearing them. Then a couple of people in the band started wearing them. Then it just became a thing. And, you know, not just in funk, but, you know, rock and roll, you know, uh, big hair rock bands and yeah. And all kinds of stuff, and Grandmaster Flash and Furious Five. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Yeah, man. I remember, man. That's, those were the days. Oh, <laughs> so when you yep. when you you, you started uh, playing with Prince in 2002 during the One Night Alone tour, and you went all the way until when? Till 2009. To two thousand nine, yeah, two thousand nine. He, um, yeah, he had just like uh, pretty much taken some time off. Wait a minute. Oh, I had to look. I heard a car alarm, and making sure it wasn't mine. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. Okay. But uh, yeah, he had you know taken some time off, and I was just like, yeah. I just started doing some other stuff, man. I, I. I he asked me to throw a horn section together, five piece. And I was like, yeah, cause his thing was, he just thought that if he got all the most famous horn players in the world, that that was gonna be enough. And I tried to explain to him, I said, no, what you want are section players if you want a section that sounds good. So I threw some people together and we went up to Paisley for about a week. And we had this five piece up there and, and we were killing it. And, you know, at the end of the week, it's like, okay, yeah, I get you. So he says, I'll, I'll call you when, um, when, you know, I need you back to work on like some dates or whatever. So uh, proved that the section was working. And I, he asked me to write the horn arrangements for 175 songs. You wow. know, all of them in his catalog. And I was like, oh, okay, you know, this is going to be a, a, a pretty big undertaking. And then I saw what I got for that week. And I, I wasn't happy with what he paid me. So I was just like, mm, man. And I said, are you sure this is it? Because I'm, I'm talking to someone else who's speaking on his behalf. I said, are you sure this is it? Because, you know, this nugget right here ain't what I'm used to. And he said, yeah, that's it. And I didn't officially quit, but I didn't pursue that gig any further either. 
And a couple of years later, he had uh, an 11 piece horn section and I wasn't in it. So I don't know, you know, it was understood that I wasn't with it anymore, but 2009 was my last time playing with him. Yeah, it seemed like- But you, but you know what, that's one of my biggest regrets because in hindsight, you know, he always had somebody that would just, you know, say yes. You know, what do you want? You know, whatever you say, you know, Prince would be like, you know, I want a purple hat made of caramel cake. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, whatever you like, whatever you like, you know, like coming to America. Yeah. I, I sincerely think, I sincerely know that he would have benefited from somebody that just got it, gave it to him straight. And, and if I wasn't such an employee minded person and maybe just maybe leaning more toward dude said, man, you, you can't do it this way and without fear of being fired or anything. I think that's what a lot of times makes people just say yes to anything is they don't want to lose the job. And, you know, if I just said, look, man, fuck the job. But, you know, really, the other thing you're doing, you need to uh, handle that a, a different way. Yeah. Had, I, I, and, and, you know, uh, I don't know, but I'm guessing that it really would have benefited from having somebody in this corner, you know, and I felt like, yeah, I, I could have done that. Could have just said, no, nah, man, because yeah. we were born three months apart. I mean, nice as it was, you know, I wasn't enamored with the gig. I got a good gig then and I get another one. Right. So, yeah. So you know, I didn't feel like I had to just sit there and just say or do whatever he wanted just for the sake of staying employed. And, right, right. And then we all know what happened. And I'm like, fuck. Yeah. Yeah. There's um, too many enablers, just too many people, too many yes men, you know what I mean? And that, that led to that, you know, unfortunately. So yeah, you, you're right. totally right about that. You should have had somebody who was just straight up with them, let him know what what do you really need to hear, you know? And, and you know, I got to think too, there were people around them, but you know, not to go into any names. I think there's some people that were giving it to them straight. The next thing you know, you didn't see them anymore. So, mm. yeah. Yeah. You know how that is sometimes, you know, people don't want to accept the truth you know, with, with some people. So that, that could have been the issue. Oh, well, you know, we got, what well, we just went through last year, 70 yeah. some million people that couldn't, that didn't want to accept the truth. So, yeah. you yeah. know, yeah. that's not an isolated incident. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's real, it's real, yeah. man. It's real. So, so I know that um, now, I mean, I know you get you, you're back busy again. You've been, you know, playing you know off and on with some different groups, local groups, and things like that. What uh, is the plan as far as the future of Greg Bohr, As far as any future gigs, future uh, recordings coming up? Well, uh, my thing is, um, I am not good at leading a band. I have good ideas, but my whole you know get up and go. And, you know, and the, I don't really have the resources that I like, but I'm definitely of a mindset of I, I can't leave this planet without leaving something resembling a legacy behind. Yeah. So, you know, I, I've recorded some stuff and, and I had two different bands. I had a band called uh, the Peloton, Great Boy Peloton. It was a jazz group, you know, suit and tie, blue note looking thing. But instead of playing all them old recycled standards, you know, I would do stuff like Steely Dan, Funkadelic, Blondie, Foreigner, uh, and make those the new jazz dances. Then I had another group called Pocket Jazz, where it was like, you know, that DC pocket and everything that we used to, but I would do jazz tunes. I would do like Weather Report and Kenny Garrett and stuff like that, but with a with that uh, with that go go pocket on it, yeah. and but you know what the the thing of it is is I was traveling a lot, and when you travel, then you come back, 
the people that handle the business side of that just act like they don't know who you are. <laughs> so it's like you got to start all over again reminding people it's like hey look you know, I'm this dude I play with that person I have this band and the only thing they can think of is uh yeah how many people can you get in my club <laughs> <laughs> so you know what maybe it's just going to come to uh just having to you know rent a space myself do all the promotion that way I cut out the middleman and just do it that way because the whole business model for playing music is changed a lot in the past 10 20 years anyway and it yeah. really changed as a result of COVID so it's just a matter of thinking outside the box and uh just coming up with a new way to do this but yeah, and, and the other thing too, man, I'm, I'm kind of like Steven now, not sure what direction I want to go to. Do I want to do jazz? Yes. Do I want to do funk? Yes. Do I want to do some some salsa? Yes. You know, I want to do it all. And it, it's not like people buy CDs. It's like it has to be all one type of music, man. People buying songs out of the cart. You know, yeah. if not, you know, book 29, a song on iTunes, or it's, it's streaming, you know, so you don't have to have a project with a theme anymore as much as you did back in the day. Just, you know, release a song and right. release another song, yeah. release another song. And, you know, people that like it, like it. And those that won't, you know, will get something else. Yeah. Commerce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things I really miss about, uh, you know, back in the day, man, the concept albums, when, when you listen to albums as a whole from beginning to end. And, yeah. You know, even, even hip hop albums, you know, even hip hop albums were good because, it, you know, a lot of hip hop albums had a concept and there was a theme running throughout the, you know, the album and things like that. Yeah. Uh, as far as you know, what, what what new artists or what, like say if we went to a, a Greg Boyer playlist right now, what artists or what songs or what music are you listening to or digging into right now? Um, classic salsa. Okay. Uh, straight ahead jazz. Uh, from a, a funk standpoint, I got to go back. But there's some people like now not right now, now, but you know the D'Angelo's, the Robert Glasper's, the yeah. Highest Coyote, yeah. um, and, and, you know people of, of of that ilk, you know, still manage to be funky, but they still, but they're current at the same time. And uh, now a, a lot of that is, you know, I don't see a lot of people using live instruments anymore like okay maybe the snarky puppy or something like that and you know there's some things bringing up snarky puppy i just don't get this music is intricate <laughs> complicated it's executed i mean but it's popular as i don't know what and it reminds me of the 10 days that maceo spent opening up for dave matthews band this that was not kitty music at all, Dave Matthews man, I mean, they playing stuff in five, five, four, and just killing. But kids, teenage kids, came out in droves, and they brought their parents with them. They that band was huge, and it's like you think of a formula for making it big. That band was not it, but they were. They were just so. Long story short. You can't uh, predict people's taste, and you can't write a hit. Right. It, right. it just doesn't happen. You know. You just so the best thing to do is just do what you feel, and if people take to it, they take to it. Right. There it is. Yeah. Is. Truth and facts spoken by Brother Greg Boyer. <laughs> hey man, you know. You know, forty some years in this business, I ain't spending with my eyes closed. That's what I know. That's right, man. 
spread, spread the wisdom, man. You know, somebody out there needs to hear that, man. So definitely. So, but my brother Greg, so we 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 want to thank you for stopping by and, and sharing your knowledge and your, and your your experiences with us. But we got a game uh, that we play inside a minute inside the Purple Mind. Okay, uh, we're going to set the timer to a minute to a minute. Bro. <laughs> Yeah, we're gonna, you know, get your get the mind going a little bit here. <laughs> okay. Rattle off the first thing comes off to you know, comes to your head there. Okay. All right, you ready? Um I'm not gonna set the timer because I don't want to look at a clock and answer no, questions you. at the I same got time. You. I, got I, got you. I got you. <laughs> I got okay. you. Okay, go ahead. Right. Favorite trumpet player. Favorite trumpet player? Mm -hmm. Um Jeez, Lee Morgan, Nat Adderley. Okay. I'll go with Nat Adderley. Nat Adderley, okay. Yeah. Favorite '80s Prince album. Sign of the Times. Favorite season of the year. Fall. Favorite nasty Prince song. Hmm. I say get off. 23 positions in a one night stand. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Favorite color? Orange. Favorite state? Maryland. <laughs> Your favorite horn that you, that you like to play? Um, trombone. Trombone. All right. That was a minute. Time's up. <laughs> uh, you got it. <laughs> okay. Thank you for playing with us, my brother. <laughs> now, what you got to know is, you ask me them same questions tomorrow, I might give you five different answers. <laughs> oh, I know, I do, yeah. man. I know, I, I know that was a tricky one because I, I know uh, Lee Morgan, one of my favorites. One of my favorite albums is, is Caramba uh, by him, and uh, in the Sixth Sense. I'm a, I'm a huge Lee Morgan fan. And then Cannonball, Mercy, Mercy, Mercy. I mean, all, all, I, I can go, the list goes is endless to me. So I totally know how that could, you know, kind of stammer you <laughs> or the next day is different, you know? <laughs> yeah, because everybody knows, you know, funky sax players, funky bass players. Yeah. Well, okay, well, let's go with horn. Everybody has a favorite funky sax player. You know, that's going to be Maceo pretty much at the top of that and, mm -hmm. and followed closely by Fred. But when yeah, you say yeah. funky trumpet player, mm -hmm. it's like, who? And, and I thought of Nat Adderley playing on Mercy, Mercy, Mercy. Yeah. He, he it, it's almost one of the things that the band stopped and he kept playing. The people would still be dancing. Mm -hmm. and, and that to me is a, is a true mark of a, a, a funky horn player. Yeah. And, and you can feel that pocket even when there's no band. Right, right. Yeah. And you guys, um, I don't know if you had anything to do with this, but you guys interpolated Hippadelphia into the MPG Act at, at a certain point too. Or, or no. I remember. Yeah, we did. And, and, and that was Prince Brainchild. You know, he's, okay. you know, because the thing of it is when he ain't around, he's listening to all kinds of stuff. And he was having a Cannonball Adderley fixation and he wanted us to do <laughs> Hippadelphia. And yeah. then another time he had a Wayne Shorter fixation. He wanted us to do Footprints. Now, what was funny was you said, I want to do this song. I was like, okay, so I charted it out. And then at the top of the chart, I put foot O T and then P R I N C E. And <laughs> he just happened to walk by and see that. And he looked at me and he just like shook his head. And I was like, ah, I got you, didn't I? <laughs> he didn't have to say a word. <laughs> Oh my goodness, to be a fly on the wall that day. <laughs> no, you wouldn't be more than... <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. Well, my brother, man, I, I, we thank you so, man, we, we humbly thank you for, for taking this time to, to spend with us, to talk a little oh. bit about your career, where, where you've been, what you've been doing, where you're going, and uh, we just appreciate your friendship and, and continued success. Much love to you, man, and, and we thank you so much for years and years of continuous funky trombone and alto and, and baritone facts. 
and, and, and thanks for having me on, man. It's a it's, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to share these stories with people, and, and, and such as yourself that, that, that ask some very knowledgeable and insightful questions instead of the Thank same you. old, you know. So what was it like doing this? What was it like doing that? You know, so like you really want to know what it's like, and you know, you know. Thanks for affording me the opportunity to to put it out there and eliminate the guesswork. Right, right, absolutely. Yeah. And I know you know it's been a little bit of back and forth, you know, with the scheduling and so forth. So I'm just glad it's, it worked out. So. Oh man, <laughs> yeah, it's been an, it's, it's an honor and a pleasure at the same time. Yes, man. Yes, it is. And and, and thank you again for uh, having a brother on, man. I appreciate yeah, it. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. No All right, it's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Multi-talented, trombonist, sax player. I mean, any, anything that you want to blow, this brother does it all. Also, Chuck Brown, Prince, the Gap Band, uh, David Sanborn, he's played with the best of the best, and he is the best of the best. So if he wasn't the oh. best, he wouldn't play with the best. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again. And so thankful to have him here join us with the Purple Brothers. And we thank all of our Purple family for viewing us. Thank you and join us again. See you soon. Thank you.